All right, kind of on the home stretch here. I only have a few things left to do on this bike before I can start it and start riding it. I got to put the chain and chain guard on it. I got to finish the exhaust, do the front brake, do the oil lines, put chemicals in it, you know, gas and oil and gear fluid. And I have to weld on this footboard tab to the frame here because the tab that would normally hold the back of this footboard come off the aluminum primary cover, which I don't have on here because I'm running the open belt. So anyhow, a few things to do, and I think I'll be firing this thing up tonight. Yeah. I'm getting to my last couple things I need to do here with the world's ugliest shovel head to wrap it up. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put the belt drive on it. This would normally have a big cast aluminum chain, primary chain case that goes on this bike. And it came with it, and I have it. The factory aluminum primary chain case and primary chain that goes on this bike makes it really hard to work on. You only need it if you want an electric start. I do not want an electric start. I want to kick this thing. So I'm going to put a 3-inch open belt drive on it. it. Makes it so much easier to work on and just really a lot smoother ride. And a ton of weight loss. So if you ride a Harley-Davidson 4-speed transmission, you know all about them. They leak oil. This one... Is needs to be rebuilt. I don't have the time to rebuild it right now, so I'm going to run it the way it is, and I'll go back, and when I have a, a week or so, I'll take some time and rebuild it. But what makes them leak mostly is the main drive gear bushing gets loose on the main shaft, so I need to take it apart and see if I need to replace the main shaft, or it just needs to have the bushing replaced. I don't have time to deal with that right now, so I'm going to go ahead and put everything else on it, show you how I do this, show, I have, show you how I set these up. The four-speed clutch can be problematic. They either have one or two issues, they slip, they won't hold the horsepower, or you get clutch drag where when you pull the clutch in all the way, the bike still wants to lurch out of light. I call it clutch drag or clutch lunge, but I'm going to show you how you set this up and eliminate all those things so you don't have to deal with them. Because it's not impossible to have a four-speed that doesn't leak or impossible to have a four-speed with a clutch that works really great. I've had them both a lot. Okay, the first order of business is to Make sure this main shaft nut is on tight. Now this main shaft nut spit, tightens, it's reverse thread. So uh, it's called left hand thread. Normal thread would tighten right hand thread, which would be clockwise, but this nut tightens left hand thread. There's a special socket you need. I don't have it, but I probably made this 25 years ago. It's a socket that I TIG welded to another socket to make it work, to go on that. So I'm gonna check it with the impact to make sure it's tight. Don't ever trust anybody else's work because as soon as you do that, you're going to find out somebody else's work is not as good as you want it. I'm not liking what I find it out. The nut is stripped. Good thing to know now. Luckily, I got a lot of parts, so I went and grabbed another nut from my stash. I'm going to go ahead and install that and get on with my business. How those nuts get stripped out is people don't know they go on counterclockwise, so they try and take them off the way you normally would, and they just hit them with an impact and beat them to death. So that's how the problems start. All right. That sucker's on there. If you can see how that sprocket and main drive gear is moving relative to the shaft, that's going to be my oil leaking problem and something I got to fix pretty soon. Okay, so this is called a Harley Davidson four speed tapered shaft. Later models had a spline shaft instead of a taper, but you can see the shaft tapers down. There's a male taper here and a female taper here on the clutch hub. And you use a Woodruff key to, lock, to hold everything in place, and then the force of the clutch hub nut forces the clutch hub onto the taper, and those two things help hold it in place and make it very strong. And the key goes in the keyway. If the keyway is damaged in any way, you need to replace the shaft, but this one's nice and clean, so I'm going to go ahead and put the key in there. And you want to put the key in at the same angle as the taper, basically. The trick is to get the clutch hub on without pushing the key out. So I always put my finger on the back of the key as I slide the clutch hub over and I kind of wiggle it around and I can feel the key. And now 
here I am, I've got a good fit there. There's a little lock tab that goes in there to hold the clutch hub nut. I never use these, I don't like them. I think they cause problems. I've never used them in 35 years. I'm not using it today. I use thread locker. Just like the main shaft nut that holds the sprocket on, this clutch hub nut is also left hand thread. And so you turn it counterclockwise to tighten it versus going clockwise like you traditionally would. And this is where, again, a lot of people make mistakes. I'm sure there's a torque value in a book somewhere for that. I don't know what it is. I've never used it. I've always just cranked it down with a good impact and considered that good enough. Little grease won't hurt these bearings. This is what's called your clutch basket. And the clutch basket rides independently of the hub. So when your clutch is engaged, the basket grabs the clutch hub and turns it and turns your transmission. When the clutch is disengaged, the hub stays still and the basket spins around it. I'm going to show you something I've always done with these things to make these four-speed clutches work good. So I'm going to take this retaining ring off. These springs and this retaining ring are going to come off. So I pull this <clears throat> metal retaining ring off, and I don't use that. I use, this is from Sifton, a company called Ramjet makes one too. <clears throat> I don't know, you know who invented it, but it's a little retaining ring. And what's great about these is, when you put the clutch basket back on, this little ring rides inside here and allows you to adjust how much float this basket has. When you don't have this plastic ring, this thing can float as much as it wants and the only thing really keeping it in place is the belt. So when you put this ring in, you can f has different height adjustments that you use with a snap ring that are gonna allow me to control how much float it has, how much it migrates in and out. I've sworn by these things for years. I recommend it to anybody who's running a Harley Davidson four speed, whether you're running a belt or a chain, it doesn't matter. You kind of got to have this thing. It's not really securely on there yet, but it's already controlling the float of the clutch hub. You want a little bit of free float, but not a lot. I'm going to find the minimal amount. I just expand the snap ring, just expand the snap ring and then push it down on with a screwdriver, get it in there. So if you got a homeboy that's always having clutch problems with his four speed, be a good friend and go buy him one of these things, this little kit, I don't know what they are, they're probably 10, 15, 20 bucks, worth every penny of that, that'll solve a million problems for you. You can see how I've got this in here, I can just spin it now. Before when I was spinning it, was wanting to walk out. Now it holds it in place and it'll solve a ton of problems for you clutching. I'm ready to do what's next. So put in my clutch plates. And these are old used clutch plates, but they're okay. You put in a friction disc and then you put in a steel drive disc and they're always marked out on the steel disc. So one goes out and then I put in another friction disc. Another steel drive disc. There's my out marker. Another friction disc. Another steel disc with the out marker. Another friction disc. No. Then. So I, I forgot to put this out of bearing support on. Normally the aluminum primary would house a bearing that would support this transmission main shaft. And when you don't use aluminum primary, you need to use one of these bearing supports. I forgot to put it on when I put the clutch basket on. So I took it off, put that back on, and now I'm going to reinstall the clutch basket. I'm going to put the key in. You don't have to take the clutches back out. Just got to line the key up. So I always put the key at 12 o'clock and then try and line the keyway in the basket up at 12 o'clock. There you go. Let me go back and put my thread locker back in here again. Put my clutch hub nut back on. I 
Let me show you when there's no pressure on the clutch discs. You can just spin the clutch basket real easy, but as soon as you put pressure on, it stops it, and that's what engages your clutch hub to drive your bike. So that's what your clutch springs do when this whole assembly is together, is when it's loose, it's free. These, these plates are able to float free, independent of the basket, and as soon as you, as soon as you tighten it, now it's locked. And that's just my finger pushing a little bit. You can see I can't break it. And that's how your clutches work. So I've got this. You guys all know I'm a huge fan of Indian Larry's. I'm friends with the guy and big fan of his work. And so I've been using these Indian Larry pressure plates on every bike I do uh, that has a Harley Davidson four speed just because Indian Larry loved the Harley Davidson four speed. So I got to ride with me everywhere I go. Every time I look at the bike, it'll make me think about something about him that um, made him who he was. Let me show you how I put this clutch pressure plate together. All right, this is an old trick for putting these pressure plates together with the springs because if you don't do it this way, these springs are going to be trying to fall all over the place. So I always stack my springs inside the pressure plate. You put your 10 springs in, then you line your spring plate up. So there's five holes on the spring plate and then five little nubs. Well, the little nubs are all going to seat inside each one of those springs. And then the five, these five studs are going to come through the other five holes that are open. Then how I make this easy is any kind of washer, or valve spring retainer, anything you can find that will fit will go in there. And you put your clutch hub adjusting screw in there. And then you put your clutch hub adjusting nut on the screw and you tighten the nut down. And what will happen is this washer holds the whole assembly together until you get everything installed. Then you take the washer off and you can release your spring pressure. So I'm going to compress it down a little bit. All right. A little tap. There you go. And then you put your clutch hub nuts on. There's five of them. They have a little groove cut in them that locks them in place so they can't spin off. So you got to put the little groove facing in. This may, in fact, be the one millionth time I've done this. I don't know how many times I've done it, but it's a lot. You can hear those nubs clicking in those grooves as I tighten these down. That's what keeps the nuts from being able to spin off. There you go. That's the trick. That little washer right there. Everything else belongs on the bike. The washer doesn't. I'll get into adjusting the clutch later. I'm not going to do that right now. But for the time being, I'll just screw this adjusting screw in a little bit. So I put my belt on. My transmission is loose right now. I'm going to need to adjust this belt tension. So I leave the transmission loose until I get everything all set up and get my front pulley on here. You see that belt tension is kind of loose right now, but I can pull the transmission plate back and tighten it up. And as I tighten it up, I'll show you how to set this tension too. If you have this too tight, if you have it too loose, it's not good. And if you have this belt too tight, it'll make the clutch operate improperly. And I'm going to put this engine nut on. Now this engine nut is a right hand thread. It goes on normal and you put it on clockwise. Everything on the transmission main shaft is left hand thread, but the engine shaft is right hand thread. Now I got the primary assembled. I'm going to pull the transmission back. You can't see it, but there's a, this is not a factory transmission plate. This is a custom plate that has an adjuster in it, which is really great when you have a belt drive because you don't want the plate moving. And with a belt drive, if it moves, it can cause you a lot of problems. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the gearbox back and watch. You can watch as that belt ten tension is starting to get tighter. And that's probably about as tight as I want it. Now this belt will stretch a little bit, but not much. But this makes it so much easier. I can get in here if I have to do nuts and bolts. I can get under the oil tank when the aluminum primary is in here with all the electric start stuff. 
There's no room to get your fingers in here anywhere. Any mechanic is going to tell you that. I'm not making this up. <clears throat> right, I got those transmission bolts tightened. This primary is together for good until I decide I might need to take it off or something, but everything's together. Now I can move on to something else. There's still quite a list of things that need to be done here, but I am making it through. Indy Larry, New York City. So I got this two in the one head pipe on here. I need to make the tailpipe section for it. I'm probably gonna have to take it on and off a couple times because the tail section is gonna come up here, pivot up and go back out. So it has to come around the shock absorber. So maybe it take me a couple tries to get it right, but I'll show you how I do my process. I got my exhaust header pipe on. You'd normally put like a slip on muffler on here or a fishtail or something like that. I've got this pretty cool upsweep. It should kind of go right here. The problem with this going here is this is for a rigid frame bike. And because the FLH has shocks in the back, when I move this in where it would normally line up, the exhaust is going to want to interfere with the shock. I can rotate it out a little bit, look kind of funny, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this two into one junction off right here, cut it off right behind that, and then weld that onto the back of the pipe that I have. And I'll have myself a pretty sweet looking little custom pipe. Now that I'm cut, I'm going to weld this piece right on here. I think that's going to be a really good looking pipe for this kind of bike. Definitely matches the style. Okay, check out how I set this up for welding. So I ground a little V in each end of the pipe to get a good TIG weld there. And I'm going to hold these two together with a little metal clamp. But to keep it at the angle I want it, I'm going to use this motorcycle jack on the back here with a couple V blocks. So I put it like that and set a V block up. And all I do is jack the jack up and get the angle I want. It'll hold it in place for me. It holds all that weight so I can have both hands free to TIG weld because you need both hands to do a good TIG weld. I jack it up in the back there. I'm going to line it up, line it up, up here in the front. I got to get it lined up where I can get a good 360 degree weld on it. Raise it up a little more in the back and close that gap on the top. So I feel like I'm in a good spot, really good position to weld right there. I'm going to go ahead and turn the TIG machine on and start running an arc. And now with a couple small tacks, I'll come in with the TIG welder and just weld the bead around. The pipe really can't move a whole lot. I'll get as much as I can get from this side, then I'll take the pipe off the bike, finish it up, put it back on, make the mount, then we're ready to hear this engine bark. I got a nice tight little TIG weld in there. I'll pull this stuff away now. Got this thing all welded up. But don't get the party started just yet.
For the rear mount, I cut the long bar that was off. And I'm using this P-clamp, and I'm going to run the P-clamp right over top of the weld. So first of all, that'll mask my weld. And second of all, it'll provide a lot of extra strength there. Even though I know my weld is strong, it'll make it nice and strong right there at the joint. And I want my mount as far back as possible because it's mounted to the head up front there. So it'll keep this from flopping around back here through vibration and everything else. So I'm going to go ahead and get my bolts up through here. Now I just have to tighten the exhaust bracket to the frame and I'm done with that piece of the puzzle. This is your timer advance unit. It runs on the end of the engine camshaft and it rotates counterclockwise. As the advance unit rotates, these flyways fly out and advance your timer cam. That timer cam that's moving is what opens and closes your points and creates a spark to your spark plug. So since this is rotating counterclockwise, when the weights come out, it advances the cam counterclockwise and it opens the points sooner. That little narrow lobe on the cam right there opens the points for the front cylinder to fire. Time opens the points, the current jumps across the points contacts. That's that arc you see there. And that arc fires the coil in your spark plugs. I'm going to show you how to time a Harley Davidson V twin engine. This is going to work for anything really from the Harley JD model forward. You know, all the V model flatheads, the U model flatheads, the knuckleheads, panheads, shovelheads, uh, and even really the Evo works the same way. So um, the first thing you got to do is you need to get your front cylinder on the compression stroke. I'm going to show you how I find that. The intake valve opens, and as the intake valve closes, the front piston starts to come up on the compression stroke. So what I do is I pop the front intake push rod tube off, and I'm going to roll the engine over, and I'm going to roll the engine over and watch that front intake stroke happen. There goes my front intake push rod opening. And as it starts to close, my front piston's coming around for the compression stroke. So I'm starting to get in the right area. And I'm going to show you exactly how I find that spot. Left side of your engine, this is your timing hole plug. And the timing hole plug <clears throat> gives you access to look at the flywheel. The flywheel has a mark on it called a timing mark, which allows you to time your front or rear cylinder spark in advance. So we got good light in there. What's going to happen is, as I roll this flywheel over, you're going to see a vertical line appear in that window. And that's going to be your front cylinder advance mark on an early model like this. Later they change it to a dot, but on this bike, 1972, it's going to be front cylinder advance mark. There's your, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a rear cylinder top dead center mark. It's a dot with an R. And then next should be the front cylinder advance mark. And there's the F with a vertical line. I don't know if you can see that. Normally I just have a vertical line and not an F. Somebody's marked it. With my front cylinder on the compression stroke and my flywheel timing mark in the timing plug hole, I need to roll the, I need to roll the advanced unit cam counterclockwise to the full advanced position. With my advanced unit cam rotated counterclockwise in full advanced position, the circuit breaker points should just be beginning to open with the flywheels in the position they're in. And they're not, so that means my timing is retarded. So how I fix this, I'm going to loosen my plate and advance the timing some. You advance your timing by moving the plate clockwise. Now I'm going to tighten it down and try this again. Sometimes it's easier to take the condenser out of the way when you do this. See how my points are just opening now? And that may be a little over advanced. A little over advanced is okay. It's retarded that you really worry about. And well, how I know it's over advanced is when I go to Kickstarter.
if it kicks back at me consistently through the Kickstarter, then that means I'm over advanced and I can back it off just a hair. But I'm in the ballpark now for where this thing should start really easy. And I'm very good at getting these things to start on one kick. That's where I'm going to get it. And this is the method I use to get me there. Here's a little trick I use when I'm running an open primary. You know, my timing mark is centered in the timing plug hole. I just go ahead and mark my charging system rotor in my engine case. That before I rotate the engine over that way, no matter where I roll the engine over, I can always get myself back to that advanced mark without having to pull this and look inside there. Because once there's oil slinging around inside the engine, it's a lot harder to see. And I can time it with a timing light here without having to have oil blow out of that hole. When you time, pull this plug and run the engine and hit it with a timing light, the crankcase pressure wants to blow oil out of the hole. So this way you can time it with a timing light without having to have any oil mess. Okay, so here she is, world's ugliest shovel head, 1972 Harley Davidson FLH. I think I've got it ready to where it's ready to start. Let me remind you, this bike has not been registered since 1994. You know, we've all heard the rap ran when parked, right? You know, the rap I got on this was that the engine was damaged. It got rebuilt in 1994, never got put back on the road. I took a look inside the engine. It does look like it's been rebuilt or at least worked on. Somebody did a lot of work on it. So I've got it timed. I got fuel and oil in it. I got gear oil in it. The points are sparking. I feel like I'm ready to start it. But remember, you're talking about almost 30 years since it's been run now. So don't expect too much from me, but I am pretty good. Okay, so you can see the pipes are cold. So this isn't gonna be any hop start. I'm expecting a, a few kicks. I'm gonna pull the choke and richener up on the SNS. Turn the key on. Well, there it is, world's ugliest shovel head. Maybe not so ugly anymore.